Hey everyone! Before we dive into today's video, make sure to smash that like button, hit subscribe, and let me know what you think in the comments below. Your feedback is super important to me, and it helps me create even better content for you guys. Let's get this conversation started. I know what you're thinking. He did what on the dark web. Yeah, it sounds crazy, but let me explain. And I gotta be quick about it, because I don't know how much time I have left. See, I'm not exactly what you call a saint. I like to indulge, dabble in things I probably shouldn't. Weed's my usual vice but that's easy enough to score from a friend. But when I wanted something with a little more kick, acid, maybe some coke, that's when I dive into the murky depths of the dark web. It's surprisingly simple, really. A few clicks, some Bitcoin transfers, and bam, next thing you know, I'm signing for a package at my P.O. box with a grin and a pounding heart. But I'm also a curious guy, always have been. The dark web, with its hidden corners and whispered secrets, had always pulled at me. Until a few days ago, I'd only ventured into its depths for those quick drug deals, sticking to the paths laid out by my friends. But one night, I found myself sober and alone, a rare occurrence, with an itch to explore. Boredom, coupled with a morbid curiosity, led me to fire up the Tor browser and see what kind of twisted stuff I could uncover. Now, if you've ever been down that rabbit hole, you know it's not like Google. You can't just type in Red Rooms or Hitman for Hire and expect a neat list of results. No, you need to find the hidden doors, the secret links that lead to those dark corners. So, I hopped back onto Google, seeking a gateway to the underbelly of the internet. I know, I know, it sounds messed up, actively searching for the worst of humanity. But there was this pull, this morbid fascination that I couldn't shake off. I spent what felt like hours sifting through forums and threads, chasing shadows and dead ends. Most of what I found was either too tame or simply didn't work. Frustration was building, and I was about to call it quits. I wish I had. But in one final, desperate attempt, I clicked on a Reddit link, landing on her slash deep web. I didn't expect much, figuring it would be the usual mix of creepy pasta and cautionary tales. I scrolled through the hot posts, then switched to new, hoping for something, anything, to spark my interest. And then I saw it. A simple text post, stark against the dark background, titled, Slayer's Assassination and Life Ruining Services. The post itself contained a jumbled string of characters, ZY3 Kid Cop 2Y3, if you're curious. It took a moment for my sleep-deprived brain to register what it was, a link. A link to a hitman website. My heart pounded in my chest, a mix of excitement and fear. I hesitated, my finger hovering over the mouse button. But curiosity, as always, won out. I copied the link, pasted it into my Tor browser and held my breath. The page loaded. The first thing I saw was the site's name, emblazoned across the top in bold, crimson letters, Slayer's Assassination and Life Ruining Services. Beside it, a skull nestled within a crosshair. I chuckled, a nervous laugh escaping my lips. It had to be a joke, right? But as I scrolled down, my amusement faded. 
The page was stark, minimalist, with a single paragraph of white text against a black background. To the right, a small, unassuming box with the words place in order. The text itself was chilling, sending a shiver down my spine. Slayer's Assassinations and Life Ruining Services offers a comprehensive suite of services catering to your most discerning needs. From acid attacks and crippling to blinding, castration, torture, rape, beatings, and the classic, time-honored tradition of death, we provide it all. Our prices are the lowest in the industry, and our reach is global. With a dedicated and experienced team stationed across the world, we can ensure your target receives the precise attention they deserve. Whether you seek a swift end or a lingering torment, don't hesitate to contact us. I stared at the words, my mind reeling. This had to be satire, some elaborate dark humor designed to shock. I was half tempted to place an order just to see what would happen. Hell, I could afford it. But something held me back, a nagging sense of unease. I was about to close my laptop and call it a night when a knock on the door startled me. I lived alone, so visitors, especially this late, were unusual. But when I opened the door, there stood my buddy. Jake, my trusty weed supplier. He grinned, pushing past me and holding up a massive baggie filled with what looked like the dankest weed I'd ever seen. Dude, this is the bomb. We gotta try this. I couldn't resist. Fast forward a couple of hours. It was early morning, the sky just starting to lighten and Jake and I were sprawled on the couch, completely baked. He suddenly got up, and I figured he was heading for the leftover pizza, but instead, he wandered over to my desk and peered at my computer screen. Slayer's assassinations, he mumbled, squinting at the screen. You gonna off someone or what? Ha! Huh. I mumbled back. My mind's still hazy. Your computer, man, he said, pointing at the screen. It's got some freaky stuff on it. It's the dark web, dude, I warned, don't mess with it. I was half asleep, not really paying attention, but I snapped to attention when he said, Hey, let's order a hitman on you. I shot up my heart pounding. Part of me was screaming, no way, are you insane? But the other part, the part fueled by the potent wheat and a twisted sense of humor, thought it would be hilarious. So, I agreed. I did make him get out of my chair, though. No way was I letting him see my credit card details as I transferred the bitcoin. After filling in all my personal information, my address, age, even a photo, I had to select the service I wanted. I opted for the basic assassination package. It was surprisingly cheaper than some of the other options. I could have paid extra for a beating beforehand, but even my eye brain wasn't that keen on splurging on my own demise. With a few clicks, the order was placed. I replied to the confirmation email, and that was it. I had ordered myself on the dark web. Jake and I laughed about it for a while, but then he left, and I passed out shortly after. I woke up around 9 a.m., feeling like I'd slept for three hours, even though it had been closer to six. I stumbled out of bed, threw on some clothes, and made myself a coffee. I planned to spend the day gaming, enjoying my Sunday. Then the memories of the previous night came flooding back. My blood ran cold. I'd ordered my own death. 
Even though I dismissed the website as a joke, a pit of dread opened in my stomach. I chuckled nervously. Jake's week really was something else. I figured a normal person would probably be panicking, calling the cops, doing something, anything. But I was still feeling the effects of the weed, and a strange sense of detachment had settled over me. I carried on with my day, trying to ignore the gnawing anxiety. I even laughed at the email I received from the website, informing me that their hitman had been dispatched. It was like ordering a package from Amazon. I was almost tempted to reply and ask for express delivery. But I didn't need to ask because that's exactly what I got. I didn't see it arrive, but as I was starting to cook dinner, I noticed a blacked out sedan parked across the street. I didn't live in a rural area, but the houses on my street were spaced out, with plenty of trees and bushes between them. I doubted anyone else could see the car. Panic surged through me. What if the website was real? I was a big guy, but the thought of a hitman sent chills down my spine. I didn't own any weapons, just a slightly larger than average kitchen knife. Screw it, I muttered, adrenaline coursing through my veins. I grabbed the knife, shoved it into my hoodie pocket, and marched out of the house. I walked straight up to the driver's side window of the sedan, surprised by my own boldness. I knocked on the window. Nothing. It was anticlimactic. I'd been prepared to fight for my life, all because of a stupid decision made while high. I peered through the window, trying to see inside. The car was empty. No one. I waited for a while, but after half an hour, my hunger got the better of me. I went back inside to check on my dinner. I swear, it was only a minute between me going inside and looking back out the window, but the car was gone. Vanished. Guess I'm eating with all the curtains closed and doors locked, I mumbled to myself. Just as I started to calm down, the power went out. It was still daylight outside, but the sudden darkness, coupled with the mysterious car, confirmed my worst fears. This was real. I'd signed my own death warrant. I raced upstairs, locked my bedroom door, and hid under the bed. Calling the cops seemed pointless. What would I say? Hi, officer. I accidentally ordered a hitman on myself while high. Can you send someone over, please? So, here I am, hiding under my bed, writing this. Consider it my epitaph. I know I'm screwed. Just a minute ago, I heard the back door creak open. This whole thing might seem funny to you, the reader, but right now, I'm praying to a God I haven't believed in for years, begging for a miracle. But I know it's not coming. My bedroom door just creaked open, and I can see a pair of heavy black boots. Look, I ain't gonna sugarcoat it. I'm no saint. Truth be told, I'm probably closer to the other end of the spectrum. Back in the day, I was all about the party life, raves, clubs, you name it. Drugs, booze, the whole nine yards. It's not exactly something I brag about these days, but hey, with no family to speak of and my friends dropping like flies, I figured, why the hell not? I had zero plans after high school, so I might as well make the most of my time on this messed up planet, right? 
But here's the thing about scoring drugs, it ain't exactly a walk in the park. You gotta deal with shady characters in sketchy places. Most of the time, the stuff was decent enough, dealers gotta keep their customers alive, after all. But the whole scene was a hassle. Getting busted or ending up with some bunk crap wasn't worth the stress. That's when I stumbled onto the dark web. Picture this, an online marketplace where you can score top shelf stuff with a few clicks, delivered straight to your door in a plain package. Way safer, and you even get reviews in forums where people share their experiences with different pills. It was like Amazon for vices. But things change. Over time, some of those dot onion sites started disappearing. Maybe the dealers got spooked, or the feds caught up with them, who knows? Without a reliable hookup, I had to delve deeper into the dark web's underbelly. Forums were mostly filled with outdated posts, and a surprising number of sites had been taken down. The ones that were still active mostly peddled weak, questionable stuff. Finally, I got a lead on a new site. Never heard of it before, but their prices were dirt cheap, and the site itself looked slick and professional. Call me naive, but I figured a website that looks legit is probably, well, legit. Never claimed to be a genius, okay? Yeah, I fell for it. Hook, line, and sinker. And it almost cost me everything. The website was bare bones, no name, just a logo, a pill dead center and a bullseye. They only sold one thing, but it had hundreds of rave reviews in a bunch of different languages. It didn't seem fake, either. These felt like real people sharing their experiences. So, I took the plunge and ordered the weekend package, three pills. It was the cheapest option per pill, and I figured, what the hell, right? True to their word, the package arrived the next Friday, plenty of time to get my party on. I prepped for a night out, popped the first pill with half an hour to spare. I did the math, made sure the dosage was right for my weight and experience. Overdosing was the last thing I needed. Then, I headed out, ready to lose myself and the music in. Blackout. Total darkness. My memories are a jumbled mess, shattered fragments I can't piece together. Did I even make it to a club? Did I pass out on the street? No clue. It's all blur, a kaleidoscope of colors and sounds that make no sense. It's like that pill wiped my brain clean. Next thing I know, I'm waking up on a rough, splintery wood floor, covered in my own puke. But the nausea was nothing compared to the confusion. Where the hell was I? It was pitch black, which was both a relief and unsettling. At least my eyes weren't throbbing, but the darkness just added to the mystery. The room was bare, a dusty cupboard, a couple of moldy chairs, a busted fireplace. The windows were boarded up and covered with thick curtains. Three strangers were sprawled out on the floor with me. Two guys, one older, one my age, and a young woman who looked barely out of her teens. I rolled over, trying to sit up, groaning as pain shot through me. My body felt like it had been through a war. Hey! I croaked, but my voice was a dry rasp. Finally, I managed to get to my feet and peek through a crack in the window. We were in some kind of cabin, deep in the woods. 
Had I met these people at a party? Stumbled into some drug den? I had no idea. Then the girl started moaning, coming around. She looked at me, eyes wide with panic. Didn't recognize me at all. Then she took in the room, and fear washed over her face. She scrambled to her feet. Where am I? Who are you? She stammered, taking a step back. I raised my hands, trying to calm her down. Hey, chill out. I'm not gonna hurt you. I'm Wilson. I just woke up here too. Think I had a bit too much to drink last night. Don't remember a thing. She paused, her eyes darting around the room. The realization hit her. She couldn't remember anything either. I was. I was just partying. I don't. She trailed off, shaking her head. What's your name? I asked. Lisa, she mumbled. Okay, Lisa. Any idea where we are? She shook her head again, lost in the fog of her own memory. We stood there for a moment, two strangers in a strange place, trying to make sense of it all. That's when the older guy started to stir. Salt and pepper hair, looked to be in his early fifties. I leaned down to check on him, but as soon as he saw me, he lunged, grabbing my throat and flipping me onto my back. He started choking me before I could even blink. What the fuck are you doing in my house? He roared, his grip tightening. Lisa screamed and tried to pull him off, but she was no match for the guy. He was built like a tank. Luckily, her struggle gave me just enough of a distraction to shove him to the side and break free. I gasped for air, my throat burning. Stop. I coughed. I'm not trying to hurt you. The man blinked his eyes finally focusing. He looked around wildly, taking in the unfamiliar surroundings. The confusion on his face mirrored our own. Where am I? He rasped, his voice hoarse. We don't know, I said, still struggling to catch my breath. Why the hell did you attack me like that? Thought I was at home, he muttered. Didn't even leave the house yesterday. What the? He trailed off, rubbing his eyes, trying to clear his head. He was a solid guy for his age, clearly no stranger to a fight. Lisa cautiously approached him. I'm Lisa, she said, extending a hand. Adam. Adam Morrison, he replied shaking her hand. You guys remember anything? We both shook our heads. The other guy was still out cold, face down on the floor. Adam went over and shook him, hoping he might hold some answers to this messed up situation. Hey man, wake up, Adam said, giving the unconscious guy another shake. Nothing. Oh boy, this ain't good, he muttered. He rolled the guy over. Lisa and I both gasped. His shirt was stained crimson with multiple bullet holes. He was dead. Been dead for a while, judging by the stiffening of his limbs. And there was a note stuck to his chest. Lisa and I were frozen in shock. But Adam just ripped the note off the corpse and read it out loud. Thank you for your purchase. Let the games begin. My eyes locked onto the logo at the bottom of the paper, 
the bullseye with the pill. The same damn logo from the website. You recognize this? Adam asked, his eyes narrowed. Yeah. I, I bought some pills from there a few days ago, I stammered. Me too, Lisa whispered. Adam let out a heavy sigh. Guess we're all in the same boat then. Whoever these guys are, they ain't just slinging drugs. What do they mean by games? Lisa asked, her voice trembling. Not sure yet, but... A sharp knock on the door cut him off. We all jumped back, fear gripping us. Three knocks, then silence. A piece of paper slid under the door. Adam hesitated for a second, then lunged forward and threw the door open. No one. Just a dense, overgrown forest. Whoever was out there could easily disappear into the thick undergrowth. We have to practically crawl to get through that. He snatched the note from the floor and started reading. Dear users, thank you for participating in the yearly hunt. You have 24 hours to escape the forest or you will be eliminated from the game. Hunters have been dispatched to track you down. Good luck. He handed the note to me. I scanned it, my heart pounding in my chest. The same damn loco again. What the fuck are we gonna do? Lisa cried, on the verge of tears. Adam moved from window to window, checking the flimsy blinds and boards. We're gonna get the fuck out of here, he said, his voice firm. But first, you need to ditch that neon yellow top. He pointed at Lisa's shirt. What? she asked, confused. We need to stay hidden. Those bright clothes are gonna make you a target. He went to a rickety old cupboard and started rummaging through it. He pulled out a couple of faded, damp jackets and some worn-out shoes. Put these on, Adam said, tossing us the jackets and shoes. My clothes were already pretty dark, and so were Adam's. He seemed to know what he was doing, which gave me a sliver of hope in this messed up situation. You sure about this? I asked, eyeing the damp, worn out clothes. Beat staying here and getting picked off, he replied, his voice grim. He didn't need to say any more. Adam was the only one with any kind of plan, so we followed him out of the cabin keeping our heads low as we plunged into the thick undergrowth. It was midday, but the dense canopy of leaves blocked out most of the sunlight. We could barely see a few feet in front of us. Hours passed, and we didn't see any sign of the hunters. Still, Adam kept urging us to stay quiet, to follow his every step. Lisa was struggling to keep up. Her high heels had been replaced with oversized shoes that kept slipping off her feet. Suddenly, Adam froze, and we bumped into him. He was staring at the ground, his eyes fixed on a thin wire stretched between two trees. A trip wire. It was connected to a hidden mechanism that would have launched spikes from the ground if triggered. How the hell did you see that? I whispered, my voice shaking. Don't worry about it. Let's just say I've got a knack for spotting these things, he said, carefully stepping over the wire. The day dragged on, and my legs were burning. Adam kept glancing at the sky, but the sun was hidden behind a thick layer of clouds. Where are we heading? I asked, 
my voice hoarse. South. I think. Not sure, he admitted. I was exhausted, hungry, and starting to lose hope. Lisa wasn't doing much better. She slumped to the ground, desperate for a break. Adam shot her an annoyed look. The moment she sat down, we heard a faint whizzing sound, like a bee buzzing past at warp speed. What was I started to ask? Get down. Adam yelled, tackling me to the ground. Another whiz, and a chunk of bark exploded from the tree behind us. Shit, shit, shit. I screamed, realizing someone was shooting at us. Lisa scrambled to her feet and started running blindly. Adam shouted for her to get down, but it was too late. More shots rang out, splintering the trees around her. But none of the bullets came close to hitting her. It was like they were intentionally missing. She didn't get far before she stumbled into a camouflage pit. She disappeared with a scream, falling about four feet onto sharpened stakes. I couldn't bring myself to look, but her cries of pain echoed through the trees. There was nothing we could do. I instinctively started to crawl towards the pit, but Adam grabbed my arm. You wanna die? He hissed. Stay close. We need to keep moving. We crawled away from the sound of the gunshots, staying low to the ground. Just like with Lisa, the bullets seemed to be deliberately missing us. It felt like they were hurting us, driving us deeper into the forest. But I wasn't sticking around to find out where they were taking us. What about Lisa? I choked out, the image of her fall seared into my mind. She's dead. Keep moving, Adam said, his voice flat. We crawled for what felt like an eternity, until we finally reached a steep hill. Halfway down, the shooting stopped. Adam pulled me to my feet, and we scrambled down the slope. At the bottom, the trees thinned, and we burst out into a clearing. We made it. I almost shouted, but the words died in my throat. In the tall grass, figures were rising. A dozen of them, dressed in dark clothes, each holding a rifle. They were laughing at us, their faces twisted in amusement. They didn't even raise their weapons, just laughed and waved as we stumbled back into the woods. One of them even gestured for us to keep running, holding up five fingers. Five hours left. We plunged back into the dense undergrowth, the mocking laughter echoing behind us. No more bullets, but we both knew they were still there, watching, waiting. We had to get out of this forest, but we were lost, with no sense of direction. Then we saw it, a mountain in the distance, maybe an hour away. But as we got closer, the light began to fade. The clouds above thickened, and the dense canopy of leaves swallowed what little sunlight remained. It wouldn't be long before the rain started. The wind held through the trees, a chilling reminder of the approaching storm. In the deepening gloom, I tripped over a gnarled root, sprawling onto the forest floor. I yelled for Adam to wait, but my voice was lost in the wind. By the time I got back on my feet, he was gone. I stumbled on, calling his name, my voice swallowed by the growing darkness. Suddenly, the crown gave way beneath me, and I barely managed to avoid falling into a deep pit. I peered inside, my stomach churning. 
Dozens of bodies lay piled on top of each other, rotting in various stages of decomposition. That's when it hit me. The hunters wanted us to see this. They wanted us to know what awaited us if we failed to escape. Adam. I screamed, my voice raw with fear. But the wind ripped my words away, tearing them into the storm. I pushed on, the darkness closing in around me. Twigs snapped nearby, the sound of something moving stealthily through the undergrowth. Then I felt a sharp tug on my leg, and I crashed to the ground. A tripwire. But no spikes. I let out a shaky breath, relief washing over me. Then I heard a muffled groan. I looked over and saw Adam. He was pinned to a tree, metal spikes protruding from his chest and legs. He tripped the wire, the trap meant for me. He couldn't move, couldn't speak. Just stared at me with wide, pain-filled eyes. I found the exit, he croned, his voice barely a whisper. But I got careless. Oh God, Adam. I choked out, my hands hovering over the spikes embedded in his flesh. I tried to pull them out, but it was no use. He was pinned to the tree like a gruesome exhibit. He gestured weakly with a blood-stained finger towards a dark opening in the rock face behind me. A cave. Just go. He rasped, his breath rattling in his chest. And then he was gone. His eyes glazed over, his body going limp. I didn't hesitate. I scrambled into the cave, the darkness swallowing me whole. Inside, it was pitch black. I felt my way along the damp walls, guided by the sound of a faint draft. There had to be another opening, another way out. Footsteps echoed behind me, urging me forward. I ran, my lungs burning, until I finally saw a glimmer of light at the end of the tunnel. I burst out of the cave, stumbling onto a rocky slope. No rain here. Maybe the storm was trapped on the other side of the mountain. But the footsteps were still behind me, closer now, accompanied by the chilling sound of laughter echoing off the rocks. I had to keep going. I couldn't let them catch me. I reached the bottom of the slope and collapsed onto the open ground. My legs were screaming in protest, my body spent. I tried to crawl, but I was too weak. I lay there, gasping for air, as five figures emerged from the cave. The hunters. One of them raised his rifle, aiming it at my head. But another hunter pushed the gun down. Stop, he said. He found the way out. The hunt is over. They laughed again, their voices cruel and mocking before turning and disappearing back into the cave. It was just a game to them, a sick and twisted game they played countless times before. I was just another random victim, another life ruined for their amusement. It took me three days to reach civilization, three days of stumbling through the wilderness, driven by fear and adrenaline. By the time I got home, the website was gone, vanished without a trace. I tried to find the forest, the cabin, some evidence of what had happened, but it was like it had never existed. Officially, no one went missing. The people they chose for their hunts were the ones no one would look for. The ones no one would miss.
The flickering fluorescent lights of my cramped cubicle seemed to amplify the chill that had settled into my bones. Rain lashed against the windows, mirroring the storm brewing inside me. I'm Agent Alex Ramsey, and I work in the Cyber Crimes Unit of the New York Police Department. Most folks think we spend our days chasing down hackers in dark hoodies, infiltrating secret chat rooms, and uncovering global conspiracies. The truth is, most of our work involves tracking down credit card scammers and online predators, the mundane evils that lurk in the shadows of the internet. Now, let me tell you something about the so-called dark web. Forget the sensationalized stories you've heard about red rooms and hitmen for hire. It's mostly hype. Sure, there are illegal marketplaces where you can buy anything from stolen data to illicit substances, but the truly terrifying stuff? Mostly urban legends. At least, that's what I thought until that Tuesday afternoon. The call came in just as I was about to grab another lukewarm coffee. Agent Ramsey, the voice on the other end said, a hint of hesitation in its tone. We've got a peculiar situation down here. Might be something for your unit. Peculiar how? I asked, already dreading the answer. Well, it seems to involve some teenagers, a website, and a book, the voice trailed off. It's probably nothing, but, well, you better come see for yourself. Intrigued and apprehensive, I grabbed my coat and headed down to the interview room. Two boys, barely out of high school, sat nervously fidgeting in their chairs. Their eyes were wide with a mixture of fear and excitement, the kind you only see when someone stumbled onto something they shouldn't have. So, I began, settling into the chair opposite them. What's this all about? One of the boys, a lanky kid with a shock of red hair, blurted out, we found it on the dark web. A book, a really weird book. My skepticism flared. A book. That's it? The other boy, pale and trembling, leaned forward. It's not just any book, sir. It's... He swallowed hard, bound in human skin. A shiver ran down my spine. This was definitely not going to be an ordinary Tuesday. My pulse quickened. Human skin? This was no ordinary prank. I exchanged a look with my partner, Detective Miller, who had just entered the room. He raised an eyebrow, a silent question hanging in the air. I subtly shook my head, signaling that this was far stranger than anything we'd encountered before. Okay. I said, my voice carefully neutral, tell me everything. Where did you get this book? The red-haired boy, whose name I learned was Jake, spoke up. We were, ah, uh, we were trying this challenge we saw online. You know, those by something of the dark web things? Miller and I exchanged another glance. Those viral challenges were a constant source of headaches for law enforcement. So you went on the dark web, I prompted, and found a site selling books. Jake nodded. It was this weird site. All it had were these, these antique looking books. We thought it was a joke at first, but then... He trailed off, and his friend, a quiet kid named David, continued the story. We ordered one of the books. It arrived a few days ago. We didn't think much of it until... He reached into his backpack and pulled out a slim, leather-bound volume. 
I put on a pair of gloves and gingerly took the book. It felt strangely warm to the touch, the leather supple and oddly textured. I cautiously opened it, my stomach churning with a growing sense of dread. The pages were filled with photographs. A young woman, no older than twenty, smiled out from the yellow paper. She was beautiful, with long blonde hair and piercing blue eyes. The first few photos seemed innocent enough, the woman in a park, at a cafe, laughing with friends. But as I turned the pages, the images grew increasingly disturbing. The woman's smile became strained, her eyes haunted. The setting shifted to dimly lit rooms, her clothing becoming more revealing, her poses more suggestive. The final photos were... I had to force myself to look away. They were explicit and degrading, the woman's eyes filled with a chilling emptiness. What the hell? Miller muttered, peering over my shoulder. I closed the book, my hands trembling slightly. Is this all you wanted to show me? I asked, trying to keep my voice steady. David shook his head. There was this card, inside the book. He handed me a small, cream-colored card with an elegant script. It read, Thank you for your purchase, esteemed customer. Within these pages, you hold a unique treasure, a glimpse into the soul of a beautiful soul. But this book is more than just a collection of images. It is a work of art, bound in the finest leather, a testament to the exquisite beauty it contains. Feel the texture, caress the cover, and let it remind you of the precious gift you now possess. Thank you for your patronage. The words were innocuous, almost poetic. But something about them felt off. The emphasis on the finest leather, the suggestion to caress the cover, it sent a wave of nausea through me. We thought it was just some weird marketing thing, Jake said, his voice barely a whisper. But then we did some research, and we found out what anthropomorphic bibliopagy means. My blood ran cold. I knew exactly what it meant. The binding of books in human skin. A macabre practice, thankfully rare, but not unheard of. You think this book? Miller began, his voice hoarse. I looked at the boys, their faces pale with fear. I looked at the book, its leather cover suddenly repulsive. And I knew, with a sickening certainty, that this was no joke. This was real. And we were dealing with something truly evil. The room felt heavy, the air thick with a sense of foreboding. Miller, usually the picture of stoicism, ran a hand through his graying hair, his face etched with concern. The boys, Jake and David, sat huddled together their youthful bravado replaced by a palpable fear. All right, I said, my voice firm despite the tremor in my gut. We need to take this book in as evidence. And I need you both to tell me everything you know about that website. They readily complied, providing the URL of the shadowy online marketplace where they purchased the book. It was a dot .onion address, accessible only through the Tor browser, a gateway to the hidden corners of the internet. As they spoke, I felt a growing sense of unease. This was no longer a harmless prank or an elaborate hoax. We were dealing with something sinister, something that reached beyond the digital world and into the realm of real-world horror. Back at my desk, I navigated the labyrinthine depths of the dark web, 
the Tor browser my guide through this digital underworld. The website the boys had described was rudimentary, almost amateurish in its design. A simple list of antique books, each with a cryptic description and an exorbitant price. No contact information, no seller details, just a Bitcoin address for payment. It felt like a trap, a spider web waiting for unsuspecting prey. I tried accessing the site again, but it was gone. Vanished into the ether, leaving no trace. A dead end. Frustration gnawed at me. We had a potential murder weapon, a book bound in human skin, but no leads, no suspects, no way to identify the victim. It's like they just disappeared, Miller said, echoing my thoughts. The website, the cellar, it's all gone. We interviewed Jake and David again, separately this time, hoping to uncover inconsistencies or hidden details. But their stories remain consistent, their fear genuine. They were just two teenagers caught in a web of something far larger and more sinister than they could have imagined. I felt a surge of anger. These kids were victims, their lives irrevocably altered by a horrifying discovery. And we, the supposed guardians of justice, were powerless to help them. Just as I was about to concede defeat, a call came in from the forensics lab. The results of the tests on the book's binding were back. And they confirmed our worst fears. It's human skin, Agent Ramsey, the technician's voice was somber. No doubt about it. The news hit me like a punch to the gut. This wasn't just a macabre curiosity, a sick joke. This was a homicide investigation. And we were just beginning to scratch the surface of a dark and twisted mystery. The confirmation from the lab sent a jolt of adrenaline through me, chasing away the fatigue that had been settling in. This was no longer just a bizarre case, it was a full-blown homicide investigation. And I was determined to bring the perpetrators to justice. Miller and I huddled with the rest of the team, laying out the scant evidence we had. The book, the photographs, the cryptic note, the vanished website, fragmented pieces of a macabre puzzle. We decided to bring Jake and David back in, this time with a child psychologist present. They were clearly traumatized, but they might hold crucial information, details they hadn't revealed before. The psychologist, Dr. Lewis, was a calm, reassuring presence, and she quickly established a rapport with the boys. They opened up to her, revealing anxieties and fears they hadn't shared with us. And then, a breakthrough. Jake mentioned a forum, a hidden corner of the internet where users discussed unusual purchases. He'd stumbled upon it while researching the book, a place where people whispered about dark web curiosities and shared their experiences. It's called the Collector's Circle, Jake explained, his voice hesitant. They talk about all sorts of things, rare artifacts, forbidden knowledge, and, well, things like the book. This was a lead, a potential gold mine of information. I immediately dived back into the murky depths of the dark web, following the digital trail Jake provided. The forum was heavily encrypted, accessible only through a series of convoluted proxies and password-protected gateways. It took hours, but I finally managed to infiltrate the clandestine community. The Collector's Circle was a disturbing place, a haven for individuals with macabre fascinations. Discussions ranged from the historical, Victorian mourning jewelry, ancient burial rituals, 
to the downright unsettling taxidermy, occult practices, and, yes, anthropomorphic bibliopagy. I spent days sifting through the cryptic posts, searching for any mention of the website, the book, or the woman in the photographs. It was like searching for a needle in a haystack, a digital haystack filled with disturbing images and unsettling conversations. Frustration mounted as I encountered dead end after dead end. The users were cautious, their identities shrouded in anonymity, their conversations veiled in code. Just as I was about to abandon the search, a post caught my eye. It was titled simply the book, and the content sent a chill down my spine. The anonymous user described a book they had purchased, a leather-bound volume filled with photographs of a young woman. The description matched the book we had in evidence, down to the smallest detail. But there was one crucial difference. This user had included a link, a dot onion address that was still active. Could this be it? The website, the source of the macabre book? My heart pounded with anticipation as I clicked the link. But my hopes were quickly dashed. The page loaded, but instead of the website, I was met with an error message, 404 not found. Another dead end. The frustration was almost unbearable. We were so close, yet so far. The perpetrators were like phantoms, leaving behind a trail of breadcrumbs that led nowhere. I slammed my laptop shut, the image of the woman in the photographs burned into my mind. We were playing a deadly game of cat and mouse, and the mouse was always one step ahead. The dead end with the collector's circle forum left me feeling deflated. It was like grasping at smoke the promise of a lead vanishing before my eyes. But I wasn't ready to give up. There had to be another way, another path to follow. I decided to widen the search, casting a broader net across the vast expanse of the internet. I scoured online forums, chat rooms, and social media platforms, looking for any mention of the book, the website, or anything remotely related to anthropomorphic bibliopagy. It was a tedious process, like searching for a specific grain of sand on a beach. Then, a glimmer of hope emerged from an unexpected source. A true crime blog, tucked away in a forgotten corner of the web, featured a post about a woman named Sarah who had purchased a disturbing book online. The details were eerily familiar, a leather-bound volume, filled with photographs of a young woman, accompanied by a cryptic note. It wasn't the same book, but the similarities were striking. I immediately reached out to the blog's author, a freelance journalist named Emily Carter. She was hesitant at first, protective of her source. But after I explained the situation and assured her of confidentiality, she agreed to connect me with Sarah. Sarah, it turned out, was a librarian in a small town in Oregon. She was an avid collector of rare books, and her curiosity had led her to the dark web, where she had stumbled upon a website selling antique and unusual volumes. The book she purchased had arrived in a nondescript package, its true nature hidden beneath plain brown paper. When I opened it, Sarah told me, her voice trembling, I thought it was a joke. A macabre joke, but a joke nonetheless. She described the book in detail, her account mirroring the one we had in evidence. The photographs, the note, the unsettling feeling that something was terribly wrong. But unlike Jake and David, Sarah had kept the website's URL. She had even taken screenshots of the site before it vanished. 
I knew something wasn't right, she explained. I saved the information, just in case. This was a major breakthrough. We finally had a visual record of the website, a tangible piece of the puzzle. The screenshot showed a stark, minimalist design, with a single page listing a handful of books. Each entry had a brief description, a price in Bitcoin, and a buy now button. There were no contact details, no seller information, just a digital storefront for macabwares. I compared the screenshots to the description Jake and David had provided, and they matched perfectly. This was the same website, the source of the horrifying books. But there was one crucial difference. The URL Sarah had provided was different. It was a new address, a different entry point into the hidden marketplace. With renewed determination, I fired up the Tor browser and entered the URL. The page loaded, and my heart leaped. This time, there was no error message. The website was live. We were in. The website was a chilling reflection of its macabre purpose. The stark black background and blood-red font seemed to pulsate with a malevolent energy. A single page displayed a catalog of human misery, each item meticulously described with chilling indifference. The books we had encountered were there, alongside other unspeakable horrors, a necklace crafted from human teeth, a lampshade made of flayed skin, a music box that played a haunting melody when wound with a strand of human hair. The air in the room crackled with tension. Miller stood beside me, his face grim, his hand hovering near his holster. Dr. Lewis, the psychologist, observed from a corner, her expression a mixture of fascination and revulsion. Even the seasoned detectives who had joined us for this operation seemed unnerved by the sheer depravity on display. This is sick, one of them muttered, his voice barely a whisper. Focus, I said, my voice sharp. We need to gather as much information as possible. Screenshots, URLs, anything that might lead us to these bastards. We worked quickly, documenting every detail of the website. The book descriptions, the prices in Bitcoin, the cryptic messages accompanying each item, all of it was meticulously recorded. But there was no contact information, no seller details, just a digital void where the perpetrators hid. We need to make a purchase, Miller said, his voice grim. It's the only way to get a trace on them. It was a risky move, but we had no other choice. We selected an item, a small, unassuming book titled The Necromancer's Grimoire, and proceeded with the purchase. The payment process was swift and anonymous, the Bitcoin transaction disappearing into the labyrinthine depths of the blockchain. A confirmation message appeared on the screen, your order has been received. Delivery within 7 to 10 business days. We waited, the tension in the room growing with each passing hour. Seven days turned into eight, then nine. On the tenth day, the package arrived. It was a plain brown box, addressed to a fake name and a vacant lot. Inside, nestled in layers of protective foam, was the book. It was identical to the one Sarah had described, the leather cover supple and strangely warm the pages filled with disturbing rituals and incantations. But there was something else. A small, handwritten note tucked inside the back cover. It read, We see you. A chill ran down my spine. They knew. 
they were watching us. The realization sent a wave of fear through the room. We had underestimated them. They were not just sick individuals selling macabre wares. They were cunning, they were aware, and they were dangerous. And then, the website vanished. Just like that, it was gone, erased from the digital landscape. Another dead end. But this time, it was different. This time, they had left us a message. A warning. The next day, Jake disappeared. He was walking home from school, just a few blocks from his house, when he vanished without a trace. His phone went dead, his social media accounts went silent. It was as if he had been swallowed by the earth. The fear that had been simmering within me boiled over. This was no longer just a case, it was personal. They had taken a child, a victim who had stumbled upon their dark secret. And they were sending us a message, stay away, or else. But I wasn't going to back down. I would find them. I would bring them to justice. Even if it meant venturing deeper into the darkness, even if it meant facing the horrors they had unleashed. This was no longer just about solving a case, it was about saving lives. It was about stopping these monsters before they claimed another victim. The disappearance of Jake sent shockwaves through the department. The playful banter that usually filled the hallways was replaced by a somber silence. The faces of my colleagues, normally hardened by years of dealing with the city's grim realities, were etched with worry and a touch of fear. We were no longer just facing a disturbing case, we were confronting a force that seemed to operate outside the boundaries of logic and reason. The investigation intensified. We combed through Jake's social media, his online activity, his phone records, searching for any clue, any hint of where he might have gone. We interviewed his friends, his teachers, his family, hoping to uncover a lead, a connection, anything that might help us find him. But the trail was cold, the boy vanished without a trace. Days turned into weeks, the hope of finding Jake alive dwindling with each passing hour. The weight of his disappearance pressed down on us, a constant reminder of our failure to protect him. The once vibrant teenager, full of life and dreams, had become a ghost, a haunting presence in our thoughts. Then, one morning, a package arrived at David's doorstep. It was a small, unassuming envelope, addressed in a shaky hand. Inside, a single sheet of parchment, its edges ragged, its surface stained a dark, rusty brown. And on it, scrawled in what appeared to be blood, a chilling message. Stay out of our business. The sight of the parchment, the blood-red letters, sent a wave of nausea through me. This was no ordinary threat, it was a declaration of war, a macabre display of power. They were taunting us, reminding us of their reach, their ability to strike at will. The lab confirmed our suspicions. The parchment was human skin, and the blood was Jake's. The realization hit us like a physical blow, the air knocked out of our lungs. We had failed him. We had allowed a monster to snatch him from his life, to mutilate his body, to use his blood as ink for a message of terror. The news devastated Jake's parents. Their grief was a palpable force, a suffocating wave of sorrow that filled the room. Their cries echoed through the hallways, a heart-wrenching lament for a life cut short, a future stolen. I watched them crumble, their faces etched with pain, 
their eyes filled with a despair that mirrored my own. I had never felt so helpless, so utterly defeated. We were supposed to be the protectors, the guardians of justice. But in this twisted game, we were always one step behind, always reacting to their moves, always cleaning up the bloody aftermath of their crimes. The message on the parchment was a clear warning, a line drawn in the sand. They were telling us to back down, to abandon the investigation, to lead them to their dark deeds. But I couldn't. I wouldn't. I owed it to Jake, to his parents, to all the victims who had suffered at the hands of these monsters. I would not rest until they were brought to justice, until their reign of terror was ended. This was no longer just a case, it was a crusade. And I was prepared to follow it to the very end, no matter the cost. The case went cold. Despite our best efforts, we never found another trace of the website, the sellers, or any other victims. Jake's disappearance remained an open wound, a chilling reminder of the darkness that lurked beneath the surface of our digital world. The investigation officially remained open, but the leads had dried up, the trail gone cold. I couldn't shake the feeling of unease, the gnawing sense that we had only glimpsed the tip of a monstrous iceberg. The perpetrators were still out there, operating in the shadows, their depravity unchecked. The thought of them continuing their macabre trade, claiming more victims, filled me with a cold dread. The case had taken its toll on me. The sleepless nights, the haunting images of the book and its contents, the despair in the eyes of Jake's parents, it all weighed heavily on my soul. I found myself withdrawing from friends and family, seeking solace in the solitude of my apartment, the silence broken only by the incessant hum of the city outside. One evening, as I sat staring at the rain streaked window, a thought struck me. The note, the message written in blood, it was a warning, yes, but it was also a communication. They wanted us to know they were watching, that they were in control. But why? Why taunt us with their power? Why not simply disappear, leaving us to grapple with the mystery? Was it a gain to them? A twisted form of entertainment, derived from the fear and suffering they inflicted? Or was there a deeper motive, a hidden agenda behind their macabre trade? The questions swirled in my mind, unanswered, unresolved. I tried to move on, to bury the case in the back of my mind, but it refused to stay buried. The faces of the victims, the chilling details of their fate, haunted my dreams. The dark web, once a distant realm of digital anonymity, now felt like a menacing presence, a shadow lurking just beyond my perception. I knew I would never truly escape the case. It had become a part of me, a scar on my psyche, a constant reminder of the evil that existed in the world. And I knew, with a chilling certainty, that the story wasn't over. The perpetrators were still out there, waiting, watching. And someday, they would resurface, their darkness once again casting a shadow over the lives of the unsuspecting. Until then, I would remain vigilant, a silent guardian against the encroaching darkness. I would never forget the victims, their faces forever etched in my memory. And I would never stop searching for answers, for justice, for a way to bring the perpetrators to light and end their reign of terror. The case may have gone cold, but the fire within me still burned, fueled by a sense of duty, a thirst for justice, and a lingering fear that the worst was yet to come.
I was bored. Like, seriously bored. I'd been scrolling through the usual sites, looking for something new to play, something that wasn't the same old shooters and racing games. Finding decent stuff for free wasn't always easy, but hey, who pays for games these days, right? Then I saw it. Simulscape. No description, no reviews, just a download link. Probably should have skipped it, but curiosity got the best of me. I clicked the arrow and watched it download. No pop-ups, no warnings, just a quick install. Easy. The start screen was cheesy as hell. Can you escape? It asked in a dripping blood font. There were two options, start and rules. I clicked on rules, and three bullet points popped up. Don't get caught. Avoid traps. Leave the house and you win. Fake, much. I figured it was some low-budget indie game, probably made by some board coder in their basement. Whatever. I closed the rules and hit start. It took a while to load, but when it did, a hyper-realistic camera feed popped up. It looked like a security camera in someone's living room. My character was standing in the middle of the room, a blonde guy with crazy blue eyes, wearing a green jumpsuit and a weird helmet. The controls were simple, typical PC stuff. I moved the guy around, got him to the door. Locked. A message popped up, try finding a key. I searched the room, opened drawers, looked under furniture, and finally found it. Unlock the door, no problem. The feet cut out, then jumped to a different room. Two doors. A message scrawled above them in red, choose wisely. Nothing else in the room. I sat there for a minute, trying to figure it out. No clue. I picked the door on the left. The feet cut again, and I was in a new room. The door slammed shut behind my character. He started coughing. Smoke filled the room. The camera's view went dark. You lose. Try again. Great. I clicked yes. Five minute loading screen. Back to the room with the two doors. This time, my character was different. A black woman with short, spiky hair, same green jumpsuit. Okay, weird. I found the key again, went through the motions, and this time picked the door on the right. No smoke, no slamming door. Just a room filled with strings, like a spider web. I had to navigate the woman through the strings, jumping, ducking, weaving. It was actually kind of fun, and my years of gaming experience came in handy. Then my dog barked and I accidentally hit the wrong key. The woman slammed into one of the strings, and a huge red cut appeared on her arm. The camera zoomed in on her face. It was hyper-realistic, gruesome. I shuddered. What a messed up detail. I made it through the rest of the room and opened the next door. Just one word scrawled on the wall. Run. I made the woman run. There were rocks to avoid. I missed one, and she tripped, falling flat on her face. She tried to get up, but she couldn't, not with her injured arm. Then something came running up to her, a hooded figure with a knife. He grabbed her by the hair, pulled her up, 
and slit her throat. Then he looked directly at the camera, grinning. You lose. Try again. I clicked no and shut off my computer. I felt sick. The next day, I was watching the local news when the story came on. Breaking news. Two bodies were found in a field near a local elementary school. One is a white male, the other an African-American female. The female has wounds on her throat and arm. The male has no signs of physical injury. I turned off the TV. I knew. I knew how those people had died. The video feed, the woman's face, the hooded figure, the grin. It wasn't a game. It was real. I'm writing this to get it off my chest. I can't go to the police. They'll think I did it. But I can't keep it to myself either. I need to say I'm sorry. To those people. To anyone who might play that game. Don't play Simulscape. Ever. You'll regret it. And someone else might not live to regret it at all. I'd always been aware of the hidden corners of the internet. You know, the places where things get a little dark. People whisper about the crazy stuff that goes on their sites with disturbing experiments, hit men for hire, even live feeds of people's homes. It's messed up, but if I said I wasn't the least bit curious, I'd be lying. Now, just to be clear, I wasn't planning on doing anything illegal. I was just curious, wanted to see if it was really as bad as everyone said. The first sight I found was all about death. It gave me a seriously creepy vibe, so I didn't stick around long. It takes a lot to rattle me, so I was surprised I couldn't even stomach that first click. But hey, I guess it's not all sunshine and rainbows down there, right? Next, I clicked on a site showing live feeds from people's security cameras. Most were boring empty living rooms, patios. But some were weird. One room was crammed with stuffed animals, another decked out in Christmas lights and Santa statues in the middle of summer. There was even a feat of some young woman doing yoga, which had a ton of viewers. I didn't watch that one for long. Something felt wrong, sick. Like I was doing something I shouldn't be. I shook my head, trying to push down the curiosity, and move my mouse to close the window. But then I saw it, a blue link under a black screen that just said, proceed with caution. I hesitated, my inner voice screaming at me to leave, to not click. It could be anything, even something illegal. Would that make me an accomplice? But then again, what if it wasn't? Curiosity won. No matter how twisted my stomach felt, how strong the sense of dread, I had to know. I had to see what was behind that link. So, I clicked it, my mouth going dry as the page slowly loaded. It was another camera feed, but just one this time. The room was dark, concrete. There was a weird blue-green tinge to everything, like it was night vision or something. And there was a puddle on the floor. A dark liquid that I immediately convinced myself was blood. Then I saw movement. Someone was standing in the corner, barely swaying. Hello? I whispered, then cringed. Stupid. 
the person started walking toward the camera. My stomach nodded, bile rising in my throat. I knew my mouth was hanging open, my eyes wide. It was a young woman, maybe 25. Her dark hair was tangled, like she'd been pulling at it. She was limping, one leg dragging behind her. Her head was down, and the sound of her foot scraping the concrete echoed in my silent room. Then she looked up, and it was like something out of a nightmare. Her eyes were filled with tears, black makeup streaked down her face. There was blood on her chin, and her lips were sewn shut with thick, bloody thread. Her fingers were stained the same color as the puddle on the floor. My whole body went weak. I tried to tell myself it was fake, a hoax. But then I saw the viewer count in the corner of the screen, 5,623. I couldn't take it anymore. I ran to the bathroom and threw up. I lay on the bathroom floor letting the cool tiles try to soothe me. My head was spinning. I kept thinking I should have never clicked that link, should have just closed the window. But it was too late now. Should I call the police? Send them the link? Maybe they could trace it, find the girl. I knew I'd feel stupid if it was fake, but I couldn't just ignore it. Not with someone's life possibly at stake. I stumbled out of the bathroom, and just as I did, my phone buzzed. It was my girlfriend, Sarah. My voice was shaky, my eyes glued to the screen where the girl had collapsed on the floor, her muffled cries echoing. Sarah, you're not going to believe what I just saw. What? Are you okay? Have you been crying? No, I'm not okay. I choked out. I know you said to stay away from those sites, but... Are you kidding me? Her voice went from worried to angry. I told you to stay away. You never listen. There's a girl, I said my voice barely a whisper. She's trapped somewhere, her mouth is sewn shut. There's blood everywhere. I don't know what to do. Close it out. Clear your history. And never go back there again. But shouldn't I call? No, she interrupted. It's probably fake just to get viewers. People do that kind of thing all the time. That's why I told you to stay away. You could get in trouble. I didn't argue. I went back to my computer, my hands shaking as I moved the mouse to close the window. The viewer count was still climbing. I felt sick. Okay. I mumbled. We can file a report tomorrow, just in case, Sarah said. But for now, go to sleep and stay away from those sites. I didn't have the energy to argue. Tilt washed over me. I said goodnight to Sarah and went to the couch to try to sleep. I couldn't even bear to be in my bedroom, near my computer. Not while that girl was still. I knew it could be fake, but what if it wasn't? I googled fake videos on the dark web and found stories about staged webcams. It made me feel a little better, but the guilt didn't go away. I didn't sleep much. Every time I closed my eyes, I saw the girl's face, the thread, the blood. I got more and more anxious, and finally decided to go out and get some melatonin. The cool night air helped clear my head. 
I ended up buying melatonin and some stronger sleeping pills, just in case. I also got a case of water, since I'd thrown up everything earlier. By the time I got home, I felt much better. But that feeling lasted about three seconds. Because when I got to my house, the front door was wide open. My heart started pounding. I got out of my car, grabbed the crowbar I keep in the trunk, and crept toward the house. Who's there? I yelled, my voice trembling. Who's in there? Silence. I held the crowbar up and went inside. I found my phone and called 911, telling the operator I thought someone had broken in. After checking the house, I tried calling Sarah to tell her what happened, but it went straight to voicemail. The police showed up 20 minutes later. They checked the house, had me fill out a report, and said they'd keep an eye on the area. As they were leaving, I checked my phone again. Still no missed calls from Sarah. But then I saw the outgoing calls. Outgoing call to Sarah, 3.12 a.m. Outgoing call to Sarah. 3.14 a.m. Outgoing call to Sarah, 3.17 a.m. Outgoing call to Sarah, 3.20 a.m. And another one at 3.56, right around the time I got home. I hadn't made those calls. Then I saw the text I'd apparently sent at 3.23 a.m. Hey, can't sleep. Gonna come over? mind leaving the back door unlocked. My blood ran cold. Sarah had replied, Sorry, I was sleeping. Thanks for waking me up by the way. Lose your tea again? It's unlocked, don't be too late. I didn't hesitate. I locked all the doors and windows, grabbed my crowbar, and raced to Sarah's house. I drove as fast as I could, ignoring stoplights. It only took three minutes, but I knew it would be too late. Sarah's back door was wide open. I stepped inside, crowbar raised. Sarah? I called out. Are you okay? Silence. Sarah? A scream came from upstairs. I ran up the stairs, burst into her bedroom. It was empty. Then I heard the scream again, coming from her computer. I looked at the screen. It was the same website, but this time there were two women. One was lying on the floor, unmoving in that puddle of dark liquid. I recognized the other girl, it was Sarah. Her eyelids were sewn shut, and her screams were muffled, filled with terror. I grabbed my phone and dialed 911. It barely rang before a man's voice answered, you should not have called. I froze. How did he do that? How did he intercept my call? I hung up and ran out of the house, sprinting to the nearest neighbors. I pounded on the door, screaming for help until she finally opened it, her face a mix of sleepiness and fear. I stumbled inside, babbling about Sarah, about the website, about the man's voice on the phone. She tried calling the police but her landline was dead. We huddled together on her couch, both of us frantically trying to get a signal on our phones, trying to call for help, but nothing was going through. It was like we were cut off from the rest of the world. Then, her lights flickered and died. We were plunged into darkness. He's here, I whispered, my voice trembling. 
we heard a slow, deliberate knock on the front door. Neither of us moved. The knocking came again, louder this time. And then we heard it a low, guttural chuckle from just outside the door. I grabbed the neighbor's hand, my own clammy and cold. We crept towards the back of the house, our eyes darting around in the darkness, searching for an escape, a weapon, anything. We found a small window in the kitchen, leading to the backyard. It was painted shut. I frantically searched for something to pry it open, my heart pounding in my chest. The knocking on the front door had stopped. We could hear footsteps now, slow and heavy, circling the house. I found a screwdriver in a drawer and jammed it into the window frame, forcing it open. We clambered through, cutting ourselves on the broken glass, but we didn't stop. We ran, our bare feet slapping against the cold pavement, the darkness swallowing us whole. We didn't know where we were going, but we knew we had to get away. We had to escape the man with the gravelly voice, the man who had taken Sarah, the man who was now hunting us. We scrambled through the neighbor's overgrown backyard, thorns tearing at our clothes and skin. We didn't stop running until we reached the fence at the edge of the property. We clambered over it, falling onto the hard gravel of the alleyway on the other side. We were lost, disoriented, and terrified. But we were together. We need to find somewhere safe. I gasped, my breath coming in ragged sobs. The neighbor, whose name I still didn't know, nodded. There's a 24-hour diner a few blocks from here, she said, her voice shaky but firm. We can go there, call the police. We stumbled down the alleyway, our shadows stretching long and distorted in the dim moonlight. Every creak and groan made us jump, every passing car sent our hearts racing. We finally reached the diner, its bright fluorescent lights a beacon in the darkness. We burst through the doors, gasping for breath, our eyes wild with fear. The few patrons inside stared at us, their faces a mixture of curiosity and concern. We rushed to the payphone in the corner and dialed 911. But the line was dead. Panic welled up inside me again. We were trapped, cut off, with no way to reach the outside world. Just then, the diner door opened and a figure stepped inside. He was tall and imposing, his face hidden in the shadows of a wide-brimmed hat. He slowly scanned the room, his eyes settling on us. My blood ran cold. It was him. The man from the website. The man with the gravelly voice. He smiled, a slow, chilling smile that sent shivers down my spine. Hello, ladies, he said, his voice a low growl. It seems you've stumbled into my little game. The diner, once a haven of warmth and light, now felt like a cage. The man advanced towards us, his smile widening, his eyes gleaming with a predatory hunger. You shouldn't have looked, he hissed, his voice raspy and chilling. You shouldn't have clicked. I felt a surge of defiance rise within me. We're not afraid of you, I said, my voice trembling but firm. He chuckled, a low, menacing sound. Oh, but you should be, he said. You've seen too much. And now, you're going to pay the price. He lunged at us, his hands outstretched. I screamed and instinctively raised the crowbar I still clutched in my hand. It connected with his head with a sickening thud. 
he stumbled back, stunned. I didn't hesitate. I swung again, and again, and again, until he crumpled to the floor, unconscious. The diner was silent. The other patrons stared at us, their faces pale with shock. I looked at the neighbor, my breath coming in ragged gasps. We need to get out of here, I said. We fled the diner, running back into the night. We didn't stop running until we reached the police station, or we burst through the doors, breathless and hysterical. The police listened to our story with disbelief, but they couldn't ignore the evidence, the broken window, the unconscious man in the diner, the chilling website with its live feet of terror. They raided the building where Sarah was being held, finding her and the other woman bound and gagged. They were alive, but traumatized. The man, who turned out to be a notorious serial killer, was arrested and charged with multiple counts of kidnapping and attempted murder. Sarah and I were reunited, our embrace filled with relief and gratitude. The neighbor, whose name was Emily, became a lifelong friend, our bond forged in the fires of that terrifying night. We never went back to the dark web. The curiosity that had once led us down that rabbit hole was replaced by a deep and abiding fear. We had learned our lesson, some doors are better left unopened. There used to be this small YouTube channel, Jake's Scrub Guide, run by my best friend, Jake Reynolds. It was all about food, Jake trying out different snacks and drinks, giving his honest reviews. He had about 10,000 subscribers, not a huge following, but enough to keep him going. I remember countless times sitting in his passenger seat, trying to stay out of the shot while he filmed himself chowing down on some new snack he'd found. I'd only move once he gave his signature thumbs up or down, followed by his catchphrase, I like it, or I loathe it. People loved him. He had this friendly, happy-go-lucky vibe that resonated with his audience. He rarely got hate comments, and when he did, he just shrugged them off with a smile. Jake was always smiling. Then, seven months ago, Jake's scrub guide went dark. No warning, no explanation, just gone. I tried calling him, visiting his place, but nothing. Six days later, I filed a missing persons report. I was worried sick. Had he gotten into an accident? Was he ill? The police searched his apartment but found nothing. Jake had vanished. A week later, a dog walker stumbled upon a horrific scene, a mutilated body near the railroad tracks. The body was a mess, deep cuts all over, practically sliced in half at the waist. The autopsy report was grim. Cause of death was uncertain, but they suspected the massive gash across the throat was the final blow. Even more disturbing, the body was missing its stomach and heart, with strips of flesh removed from the chest, arms, and back and it was completely drained of blood. The police concluded he'd been hit by a train, the injuries and missing organs attributed to being dragged along the tracks and scavenged by animals. Jake's mom decided to cremate what was left of her son. I stood beside her as the coffin slid into the furnace. When the flames ignited, she broke down, and so did I. We sobbed for the entire 90 minutes it took to reduce my friend to ashes. I tried to move on. I got a new job, started dating a girl I met at work. Months passed, 
and the pain dulled, though I still miss Jake. Then, one night, as I was scrolling through Reddit at 3 a.m., I got a Facebook message from Jake's account. I froze. Seeing his profile picture, that familiar, wide grin, sent a chill down my spine. A wave of fear washed over me, the kind that makes you cold, your limbs heavy with dread. I clicked on the message. It was a link to a file sharing website. I stared at the jumbled URL, my mind racing. What could it be? Why was my dead friend sending me this? My hand hovered over the link, my gut screaming at me to stop. But I clicked it. Instantly, I regretted it. A new tab opened, displaying a gray screen with a black rectangle in the center. A play button hovered over it. I hesitated, fear tightening its grip on me. Then, the screen refreshed. The play button was replaced with the words auto-playing in five seconds in stark white letters. I watched the countdown, my heart pounding in my chest. A sudden buzzing noise made me jump. The video started. It showed a grimy, white tiled surface. I could hear muffled whimpering, then footsteps approaching. The camera adjusted with a rusty squeak, the image blurring before refocusing. My breath hitched in my throat. In the middle of the room, strapped to a stainless steel table, lay Jake. His eyes were wide with terror, his naked chest heaving. He looked into the camera and tried to scream, but the sound was muffled by a gag. His hands were bound with duct tape. I felt sick, my brain struggling to process what I was seeing. Then, a voice, high-pitched and mocking, cut through the silence. Welcome to Jake's Grub Guide. Today, we have a special treat. Jake thrashed against his restraints, his muffled cries growing louder. Today, we'll be trying a delicacy enjoyed in many countries, the voice continued, though it's usually considered forbidden. The camera zoomed out, revealing a man in a white coat and a red striped apron. He wore a butcher's hat and a cloth mask. In one gloved hand, he held a large scimitar, in the other, a sharpening steel. He ran the blade along the steel, the sound sending shivers down my spine. Poor little lamb, the man cooed, it won't hurt for long, and you'll be delicious. Tears streamed down Jake's face as he struggled against the restraints. The man rolled him onto his stomach, pulling his head over the edge of the table. He walked out of frame and returned with a metal bucket, placing it beneath Jake's head. Then, in one swift motion, he grabbed a fistful of Jake's hair, lifted his head, and sliced his throat. Blood erupted from the wound, splattering into the bucket and onto the floor. Jake's body convulsed, blood gushing from his neck. I vomited, the sight too much to bear. I scrambled away from the computer, collapsing by the door. The sounds from the video, slicing, grunting, filled the room. I curled up in a ball, sobbing uncontrollably. The minutes stretched into an eternity. Finally, the sound stopped. I shakily got to my feet and approached the computer, avoiding the puddle of vomit. I forced myself to look at the screen. The video had ended. The Reddit page was displayed. The Facebook tab had a notification. I didn't want to click it, but I had to. It was a message from Jake. I like it.
the flickering screen of my laptop cast an eerie glow on my face as I navigated the shadowy depths of the dark web. It was my office, my hunting ground. I was a predator, tracking down those who had become targets, snatching them from their lives, and delivering them to unseen clients. I never asked questions, never cared about their fate. Whether they ended up as slaves or hostages, it was all the same to me. The money was good, and that's all that mattered. My partner, Jake, was an old hand at this game. We met on one of the forums, a grizzled veteran looking for someone younger to handle the rough stuff. He had the experience, the contacts, I had the strength and the ruthlessness. We were a perfect match. Our routine was always the same. We get a message, a name, an address. Jake would do the research, digging up routines, habits, weaknesses. Then we'd drive out to the target's location, Jake's beat up van or chariot of darkness. We'd watch, we'd wait, and then we'd strike. It was clockwork, efficient, brutal. But this job, this one was different. The target was a young woman, living alone in a rambling old house on the outskirts of Salem, Massachusetts. The client was anonymous, the pay exorbitant, and the instructions, strange. They wanted her alive, unharmed, but they also wanted us to be extremely cautious. The house is sensitive, the message warned. Jake scoffed at that. Sensitive? What the hell does that even mean? I shrugged. Who cares? As long as the money's good. But as we drove towards Salem, a sense of unease settled over me. The closer we got, the heavier the air felt, the more oppressive the silence. We arrived at the house just as dusk was settling. It was a gothic monstrosity, all dark wood and shadowed windows, with a sprawling, overgrown garden that seemed to claw at the walls. A chill wind whispered through the trees, and the air crackled with an unnatural energy. This place gives me the creeps, Jake muttered, his usual bravado faltering. I had to agree. There was something deeply unsettling about the house, something that made the hairs on the back of my neck stand on end. We parked the van down the street and waited. The house watched us, its empty windows like vacant eyes. As the hours passed, the feeling of dread intensified. The wind picked up, moaning through the trees like a mournful spirit. The shadows in the garden deepened, twisting and writhing as if alive. Finally, the lights in the house flickered on. Our target was home. The young woman moved through the house, her silhouette visible through the curtains. She was alone, just as the client had said. We waited for her to settle into a routine, to give us an opportunity. But the house, it was growing restless. The wind howled around it, rattling the windows and shaking the walls. The shadows in the garden reached out, tendrils of darkness slithering towards the house. Suddenly, the lights inside flickered violently and then went out. The house plunged into darkness. What the hell was that? Jake whispered, his voice tight with fear. Before I could answer, a blood-curdling scream echoed from inside the house. It was a sound of pure terror, a sound that chilled me to the bone. We looked at each other, our faces pale in the moonlight. Something was wrong terribly wrong. We gotta get out of here, Jake said, his voice trembling. 
but it was too late. Thaos had us. The fan door slammed shut, locking us inside. The engine roared to life, though neither of us had touched the ignition. The fan lurched forward, careening down the street towards the house. I slammed on the brakes, but they wouldn't respond. The steering wheel locked in my grip, refusing to turn. We were passengers now, trapped in a runaway vehicle, hurtling towards our doom. The fan crashed through the gates of the house, plowing through the overgrown garden. The house loomed before us, a monstrous silhouette against the night sky. The fan slammed to a halt, the impact throwing us against the dashboard. We were dazed, disoriented, but alive. For now. The house creaked and groaned, its windows glowing with an eerie light. The front door swung open, inviting us in. We can't go in there, Jake pleaded, his voice hoarse with fear. We have to get out of here. But there was nowhere to go. The house had us trapped. We stumbled out of the van, our legs shaking, our hearts pounding. The garden surrounded us, the shadows closing in. The wind whispered our names, beckoning us towards the house. We had no choice. We walked towards the open door, each step filled with dread. The house welcomed us with open arms. The door creaked open further, revealing a figure standing in the shadows. A woman, tall and slender, with long, dark hair that cascaded over her shoulders. She was dressed in a white nightgown, her pale skin glowing in the dim light. She didn't speak, didn't move. Just stood there, watching us with an unnerving intensity. Her eyes, wide and dark, seemed to pierce through our masks, seeing into our very souls. A wave of unease washed over me. This wasn't the terrified victim we were expecting. There was something off about her. Something cold and calculating. Jake cleared his throat, his voice hoarse. We're not here to hurt you, he said, his words echoing in the silence. We just want to talk. The woman remained silent, her gaze unwavering. A slow smile spread across her lips, a chillingly predatory smile that sent shivers down my spine. I know why you're here, she said, her voice a low, husky whisper that seemed to slither through the air. I've been expecting you. My heart pounded in my chest. This wasn't right. This wasn't how it was supposed to go. Jake took a step forward, his hand reaching for the taser on his belt. Don't try anything stupid, he warned. The woman laughed, a low, throaty sound that echoed through the hallway. Stupid, she said, her voice dripping with mockery. You're the ones who are stupid. You walked into my house, into my trap. She raised her hand, and the shadows in the hallway seemed to deepen, swirling around her like a living entity. The air grew heavy, oppressive, making it difficult to breathe. A sense of dread washed over me, a cold certainty that we had made a terrible mistake. This wasn't a simple kidnapping. We had stumbled into something far more sinister. The woman stepped out of the shadows, her eyes glowing with an unnatural light. Welcome to my home, she said, her voice a chilling whisper. Welcome to your nightmare. The woman glided towards us, her movements fluid and graceful, like a predator stalking its prey. The shadows seemed to cling to her, distorting her form, making her appear larger, 
more menacing. Fear gripped me, cold and paralyzing. I wanted to run, to scream, but my body refused to obey. I was trapped, both by the woman and by the oppressive atmosphere of the house. Jake, ever the pragmatist, was the first to recover. He raised the taser, his voice shaking but firm. Stay back. I'm warning you. The woman chuckled, a low, chilling sound that echoed through the hallway. You think that little toy can harm me? She asked, her voice laced with amusement. You have no idea what you're dealing with. She snapped her fingers, and the hallway plunged into darkness. A chorus of whispers erupted around us, voices murmuring in an unknown language, their words slithering into our ears like venomous snakes. I stumbled back, my hand reaching out for support, but finding only empty air. Panic clawed at my throat, threatening to choke me. Then, just as suddenly as it began, the whispering stopped. The darkness lifted, revealing the woman standing before us, her eyes glowing with an eerie light. You see, she said, her voice a soft, seductive purr, this house, it's alive. And it's hungry. The floor beneath us groaned, the walls creaked and shifted. The house seemed to come alive, its shadows stretching and contorting, forming monstrous shapes that danced in the flickering light. A blood-curdling scream tore through the silence. I whirled around, my heart pounding, to see Jake sprawled on the floor, his body contorted at an unnatural angle. His eyes were wide with terror, his mouth open in a silent scream. Before I could react, the shadows descended upon him, engulfing him in a swirling vortex of darkness. His screams were cut short, replaced by a sickening crunching sound. I watched in horror, paralyzed by fear, as the shadows consumed him, leaving nothing but an empty space where he once stood. The woman smiled, her eyes gleaming with triumph. He wasn't the first, she whispered, her voice a chilling caress. And he won't be the last. She turned her gaze to me, her smile widening. Now, it's your turn. Adrenaline surged through me, overriding the paralysis of fear. I turned and ran, blindly, desperately, through the labyrinthine corridors of the house. The floor tilted and swayed beneath my feet, the walls closing in, threatening to crush me. The whispers followed me, taunting, cheering, urging me onward. I burst through a door, stumbling into a room bathed in an eerie green light. Bookshelves lined the walls, their shelves overflowing with ancient tomes bound in leather and human skin. A fireplace crackled in the corner, casting dancing shadows that writhed and twisted like tortured souls. And in the center of the room, sitting in a high-backed chair, was the woman. She smiled, a slow, predatory smile that sent shivers down my spine. You can't escape, she whispered, her voice a silken thread that wrapped around my heart. This house, it's a part of me. And now, you're a part of it too. I backed away, my hand reaching for the doorknob, but it turned to dust beneath my touch. The door vanished, the wall ceiling shut, trapping me within the room. The woman rose from her chair, her movements fluid and graceful, like a phantom gliding through the air. Her eyes glowed with an otherworldly light, her smile a promise of unimaginable horrors. You're mine now, she whispered, her voice a seductive purr. And I'll savor every moment of your fear. She lunged at me, 
her hands outstretched, her fingers elongated into claws. I screamed, raising my arms in a futile attempt to defend myself. But her touch never came. Instead, the floor beneath me gave way, plunging me into a swirling vortex of darkness. I fell endlessly through a void of whispering voices and grasping shadows. Then, with a bone-jarring thud, I landed on solid ground. I lay there, gasping for breath, my body racked with pain. The darkness pressed in on me, suffocating, claustrophobic. I tried to move, to stand, but my limbs refused to obey. I was trapped, buried alive in the heart of the house. The whispers returned, closer now, slithering into my ears, filling my mind with images of unimaginable horror. I screamed, my voice a hoarse croak that echoed through the darkness. Then, a light appeared in the distance, a flickering flame that grew brighter with each passing moment. Hope surged through me a desperate lifeline in the sea of despair. I struggled to my feet, my body screaming in protest, and stumbled towards the light. As I drew closer, the whispers intensified, their voices rising in a crescendo of fear and agony. But I pressed on, driven by the primal instinct to survive. The light revealed a narrow passage, its walls lined with bones, its floor slick with blood. The stench of death filled the air, thick and cloying. But at the end of the passage, I could see a glimmer of daylight, a promise of escape. I took a step forward, and the whispers erupted into a chorus of screams. The bones on the walls rattled and shook, the ground beneath my feet trembled but I didn't stop. I couldn't stop. I ran towards the light, towards freedom, towards the hope of a life beyond the nightmare. I stumbled out of the passage, blinking against the sudden onslaught of daylight. I had emerged from the house, into the overgrown garden. The rain had stopped, and a weak sun struggled to break through the clouds but my relief was short-lived. The garden, it was different. The plants were twisted and gnarled, their leaves razor-sharp, their thorns dripping with a viscous, black fluid. The air hummed with an unnatural energy, and the shadows seemed to writhe and coil like living creatures. I tried to run, but the crown was soft and uneven, my legs weak and trembling. Thorns tore at my clothes, drawing blood. I fell, scrambling back to my feet, my heart pounding in my chest. Then I saw her. The woman stood at the edge of the garden, her white nightgown billowing in the breeze. Her eyes, dark and bottomless pits, fixed on me with a chilling intensity. There's nowhere left to run, she whispered. Her voice carried on the wind. This garden, it's a part of the house. A part of me. The plants around me came alive, their tendrils reaching out, wrapping around my ankles, pulling me down. I struggled, kicking and screaming, but their grip was too strong. The woman approached, her smile a cruel mockery of sympathy. You should have listened to the warnings, she said, her voice a soft, venomous hiss. This house, it doesn't like to be disturbed. The thorns tore at my flesh, drawing blood. The black fluid seeped into my wounds, burning, consuming. I screamed, my voice raw and ragged, but it was drowned out by the rustling of the leaves and the whispering of the wind. The woman knelt beside me, her fingers tracing the lines of my face. You're mine now, she whispered, her breath warm against my cheek. 
forever. The shadows closed in, engulfing me in a suffocating embrace. I closed my eyes, surrendering to the darkness, to the inevitable. The last thing I felt was the prick of a thorn, sharp and cold, piercing my heart. The dark web is full of bizarre stuff. But then again, so is the regular internet. Maybe it's all just a reflection of how weird life itself is. At least, that's what I used to think. I'm a psychology major, and I thought it would be interesting to write my thesis on internet subcultures, how they form and why they attract certain types of people. I figured there was some juicy analytical data to be mined from understanding how these little pockets of society function. I believe that what you do in your free time reveals your true self. When you're not working or dealing with the pressures of life, who are you? Are you a writer, an artist, a gamer, a collector of rare stamps? A simple hobby might not seem like a big deal in the grand scheme of things, but to me, it's everything. It doesn't matter if society approves or if it'll make you rich. We have hobbies simply because we enjoy them. Some of you might be rolling your eyes, thinking, oh great, another pretentious intellectual who thinks they're going to unlock the secrets of the universe by analyzing obscure internet communities. But I promise you, there's no grand revelation or twist ending here. I'm here for one reason, and it's not what I expected. I found something, something I think everyone needs to know about. A VTuber is an online entertainer who uses a digital avatar, usually an anime-style character, controlled by motion capture technology. They're all the rage on Twitch, YouTube, and other streaming platforms. But the one I found, well, let's just say she wasn't on any of those sites. Thanks to a certain pandemic we won't name, my classes were cancelled, giving me plenty of time to catch up on my thesis research. I started by exploring mainstream online communities like DeviantArt, 4chan, Reddit, and the remnants of Tumblr. I met some interesting people, but nothing really grabbed my attention. I hadn't planned on venturing into the dark web, but I realized that if I wanted to find something truly unique, that's where I had to go. So, I downloaded Tor and started exploring. I found a lot of strange websites and personal projects. Some were cryptic and ominous, but none really piqued my interest until I stumbled upon a random comment. I can't even remember where I saw it now, but it was the first time I encountered that name. Serafina. At first, I didn't think much of it. The comments said something like, Serafina would like to know your location. I assumed it was just some meme I didn't understand. But then I started seeing that name everywhere, in all sorts of strange corners of the web. I googled it, but nothing came up. Finally, I decided to engage with a user on a site called the Fox Den who had mentioned Serafina. Who is Serafina? I asked. Sorry, I'm old. To my surprise, they responded. She is love, she is life. I chuckled, thinking they were just messing with me. But then they added, join the game. Another cryptic response. Another user chimed in, she gave me purpose. Join us. They also included a link. I hesitated, unsure what I was getting myself into, but curiosity got the better of me. I clicked the link. 
the page took forever to load. When it finally did, I was greeted with a black background, white text, and a single question. What do you seek? I tried a few different answers, thinking it was some kind of riddle, truth, freedom, knowledge, enlightenment. Nothing worked. I thought back to my interactions with the other users. One of them had mentioned purpose, so I tried that. And it worked. The website reloaded, presenting me with another riddle. I am the essence of existence. You fear me, but cannot live without me. Nothing would be anything were it not for me. I am the spider to the fly, the tornado to the fields, what am I? This one took me a bit longer, but I eventually figured it out, chaos. The website reloaded again. This time, there was no riddle, just a bunch of numbers scattered across the page and a simple question. What is the one of two? The numbers were 65, 10, 13, 15, 333, 1, 144, 21, 1, 3, 13, 89, 2. I was hooked. This website was like a gauntlet, designed to keep people out. I spent hours trying to decipher the meaning of those numbers. I googled them, plugged them into various websites, but nothing made sense. Finally, I realized they were related to the Fibonacci sequence, but scrambled. The Fibonacci sequence starts with 0 and 1, and each subsequent number is the sum of the previous two. I tried entering the next number in the sequence, 387, but it didn't work. Then I remembered the emphasis on chaos. I did some more research and stumbled upon something called the Chaos Algorithm, a method of encryption using random numbers. I'm no mathematician, but I understood that this was about finding order within chaos. I tried using a random number generator to decrypt the message, but it was like trying to find a needle in a haystack. After countless attempts, I almost gave up. Then it hit me, the numbers were a distraction, a red herring. I focused on the question again. I tried inputting my previous answers, and a new question appeared, what is the purpose of chaos? Suddenly, it all clicked. I hit the generate button on the random number generator one more time. The first letter was T. I scanned through a list of 13 letter words starting with T, and there it was, transcendence. The page accepted my answer. I was ecstatic. The page loaded slowly. When it finally did, I was met with a wall of text. The author rambled about the state of the world ranting about how those in power were destroying freedom and making the world incredibly boring. They claimed the world was headed for a bleak dystopia. They went on about various conspiracies, but the most interesting part was the last sentence, our only hope now is to let chaos reign. A chill ran down my spine. Had I stumbled upon some kind of terrorist network? Below the text were several videos. I was hesitant to watch them, but I couldn't resist. Most of them weren't too extreme, at least by dark web standards. But then I found that video. It was titled Curbier Pedophilia. The video started with news clips about a middle-aged man who had been charged with child sexual abuse. Then it cut to a dark street. A man was lying in the gutter, bound and gagged. A figure emerged from the shadows, wearing a cartoon mask. 
blood for the mad goddess. He whispered. He turned the camera back to the bound man and... I couldn't watch anymore. The sounds were enough. What had I gotten myself into? I scrolled down, trying to forget what I had just seen. Then something else caught my eye, a live stream. I know live streams aren't supposed to be possible on tour because of the low bandwidth, but there it was. And what I saw on the screen was even more disturbing. An anime girl with large, multicolored eyes stared back at me. She had fangs, black hair with white streaks, and the symbol of chaos on her throat. Claws, wings, and tentacles writhed behind her. Ooh, your dedication is wonderful, gnarly biscuit, she said. Her voice was a bizarre mix of childlike, demonic, and robotic. It was deeply unsettling. I tried to click on the chat, but I couldn't. Then I realized it wasn't actually live, it was an archive video. I couldn't skip or rewind, so all I could do was watch. The stream continued. The VTuber interacted with the chat, using a platform I had never seen before. It looked like a cheap imitation of Twitch. I was starting to get bored. But the memory of the previous videos kept me watching. I knew this wasn't an ordinary stream. A new video popped up. It showed a man walking towards a store, wearing a cartoon mask. The comments were flying by. Praise Serafina. Blood for the Mad Goddess. Poggers. Chaos forever. Make them believe. Serafina forever. 2020 was a great year. Hundreds of people were watching. Another wave of chills washed over me. Be warned, these images are gruesome, the VTuber said. The video began to play, a rapid montage of horrific imagery, the Holocaust, the... The first thing I saw when I opened the Tor browser was an ad in stark black and white, looking to purchase infant between the ages of 1 to 12 months. We'll pay reasonable price. My best friend, Jake, was peering over my shoulder, his face inches from the screen. He let out a low whistle. Dude, what the hell? He breathed, pushing his glasses up his nose. A reasonable price for a baby? These people are sick. I tried to keep my voice steady, but a shiver ran down my spine. You think any of this is real? I asked, scrolling down the page. It was filled with even more disturbing ads, kidneys for sale, human slaves. It made my stomach churn. Jake, ever the skeptic, scoffed. Nah, it's gotta be fake. A bunch of creeps trying to freak people out. What kind of mother would actually sell her baby? There are some messed up people in the world, Jake, I said, my voice barely above a whisper. Besides, it's not like they're killing the babies. Maybe they just can't take care of them or something. Jake went quiet for a moment, his usual goofy grin replaced by a frown. Yeah, but what if it's worse than that? What if they're buying these babies for, for rituals or something? Or to use in experiments? His words hung in the air, heavy and cold. I tried to laugh it off, but the images that flashed through my mind innocent babies being tortured, experimented on, made me want to vomit. Come on, man, 
don't be so dark, I said, forcing a smile. It's probably just a bunch of scammers. But even as I said the words, I knew deep down that something about this felt different. There was a darkness lurking beneath the surface of these ads, a chilling reality that we were only just beginning to glimpse. A red room? I echoed, my brow furrowing. Isn't that, like, where, you know? I trailed off, not wanting to be too explicit. Jake grinned, his braces flashing in the dim light of the monitor. Nah, that's a red light district, dude. Red rooms are way worse. They're on the dark web, places where they livestream actual torture and murder. My blood ran cold. Seriously? I whispered, my eyes widening. People actually watch that stuff? Apparently, Jake said, his voice low. And if you pay enough, you can even tell them what to do to the victim. I shuddered. That's, that's beyond messed up. I tried to dismiss it as an urban legend, but a nagging doubt lingered in my mind. After all, we were already deep in the darkest corners of the internet. Anything seemed possible. I know, right? Jake said, his eyes gleaming with morbid curiosity. But hey, we're here, aren't we? Might as well check it out. We can always close the window if it gets too freaky. Before I could protest, he was already typing furiously, his fingers flying across the keyboard. I watched nervously as the screen flickered and changed, my heart pounding in my chest. Jake's room, usually a haven of nerdy comfort, suddenly felt claustrophobic. The posters of horror movie icons on his walls seemed to leer at me, their painted smiles taking on a sinister new meaning. Whoa, Jake muttered, his voice hushed. This is weird. I leaned closer, my eyes glued to the screen. A grainy video feed had appeared, showing a dimly lit room with blood-red walls. In the center was a metal table, stained a dark, rusty brown. Two rickety chairs sat in the corner, casting long, distorted shadows. That was quick, I said, my voice trembling slightly. What is it? What did you find? Jake's face was pale, his usual bravado gone. It was a link, for a live feed to the afterlife, he stammered, a nervous laugh escaping his lips. A red room, in hell. I scoffed, trying to mask my growing unease. Yeah, right. That's a load of... My words were cut short as the door and the video feed creaked open. A blinding flash of light filled the screen, turning everything a fiery red. When the light subsided, two figures stood in the center of the room. One was a man, bound and gagged on the metal table. His clothes were ripped and blood-stained, his face contorted in terror. The other figure was tall and skeletal, its skin is sickly white. It wore a long, black robe that billowed around it like smoke. Its face was a blank canvas, devoid of features except for a gaping maw filled with razor-sharp teeth. Greetings, the creature hissed, its voice a guttural rasp that seemed to claw its way out of the speakers. Welcome to the show. My breath caught in my throat. This was no joke. This was real. And we were trapped in the front row. Jake recoiled as if slapped, his face a mask of shock. 
I felt a wave of nausea wash over me, but I couldn't tear my eyes away. Mr. Doom's lipless mouth stretched into a grotesque grin, the skin cracking like dry earth. He moved with an unnatural grace, his elongated limbs unfolding like a spider's legs as he approached the table. Then, he reached out and ripped off the victim's hood. My blood turned to ice. It was my father. Even though it had been five years since his death, I recognized him instantly. The same tired eyes, the same crooked nose, the same scar on his chin from a childhood accident. But his face was now etched with fear, his eyes wide with terror. My father, who had been ripped from my life by a drunk driver, was now strapped to a table in some hellish red room, at the mercy of a creature that defied all reason. Tears welled up in my eyes, blurring my vision. I could barely breathe. Was this some sick joke? A hallucination? Jake, I whispered, my voice choked with emotion. That's, that's my dad. Jake, who had never met my father, stared at the screen in confusion. What? Who is that? What's going on? Before I could answer, my father spoke, his voice hoarse but unmistakable. Michael. I know you can hear me. My heart pounded in my chest. Was I dreaming? Was this some kind of twisted afterlife communication? Michael, my father pleaded, his eyes locked on the camera. Destroy the computer, get out of the house. But before he could finish, Mr. Doom's long, bony fingers clamped over his mouth, silencing him. The creature turned its eyeless face towards the camera, its voice a grating whisper that sent shivers down my spine. Michael, it hissed. You see what others cannot. The true nature of things, the reality behind the veil. Mr. Doom's words dripped with malice, his voice like poison seeping into my ears. This is where everyone goes after death. He continued, gesturing towards my father with a skeletal hand. To be tortured, for eternity. The one you call God, he despises humanity. My mind reeled. This couldn't be true. It couldn't. But the image of my father, helpless and terrified, burned into my brain. I was trapped in a nightmare forced to watch the unthinkable unfold before my very eyes. Mr. Doom, as if to emphasize his point, dragged a sharp finger across my father's cheek. The skin parted like wet paper, revealing the raw flesh beneath. My father's scream echoed through the room, a sound of pure agony that tore at my soul. Turn it off. I yelled, lunging for the computer. I jammed my finger on the power button, holding it down, praying for the screen to go dark. But the horrific scene continued to play out before my eyes. Jake, do something. I pleaded, but my friend was frozen in place, his eyes glued to the monitor, his face pale with shock. Mr. Doom, ignoring my desperate pleas, turned his attention back to my father. He reached out with those skeletal fingers, forcing my father's mouth open. There was a sickening crunch, a spray of blood, and then, silence. Worthy is the lamb, Mr. Doom rasped, his voice filled with a chilling satisfaction. Worthy indeed. Suddenly, the monitor began to flicker and distort. Static filled the screen, followed by a burst of flames that erupted from the computer itself. 
The room plunged into darkness as the power went out, leaving us in a suffocating silence. The smell of burning plastic filled the air, mingling with the metallic scent of blood that seemed to emanate from the screen. I stumbled back, my heart pounding in my chest, my mind reeling from the horrors I had just witnessed. Jake, finally snapping out of his trance, let out a choked sob. Oh my god, oh my god. I couldn't speak. I could barely breathe. The image of my father, mutilated and lifeless, was seared into my brain. The red room, the creature, the torture, it was all too real, too horrifying. We were left in the darkness, the silence broken only by our ragged breaths and the crackling of the burning computer. The red room had closed its doors, but the nightmare had only just begun. In the suffocating darkness, Jake's hand found mine, his grip tight and clammy. I could feel his fear in the tremors that ran through his body, in the frantic beat of his heart against my palm. I don't think this is a prank, he whispered, his voice barely audible. I felt tears stinging my eyes, hot and unwelcome. It has to be, I insisted, my voice cracking. It's just, it's impossible. My dad is dead. None of this is real. Then how do you explain the power going out? Jake countered, his voice trembling. And how did that, that thing, know there were two of us? And how did your father know your name? My mind raced, desperately trying to find a rational explanation. Someone hacked your computer, I said, grasping at straws. They were watching us through the webcam. That's how they knew everything. But, the fire. Jake stammered, his voice laced with doubt. It was probably rigged, I said, my voice rising in frustration. A special effect. It has to be. I was starting to lose it. The darkness, the silence, the lingering smell of burning plastic, it was all closing in on me. I needed to believe that this was all a hoax, a cruel and elaborate prank. The alternative was too terrifying to contemplate. Jake took a deep breath, his hand still clutching mine. I... I don't know, Michael. It just... it felt so real. He started to say something else. But then a sudden light pierced the darkness. The computer monitor flickered back to life, casting an eerie glow across the room. We both stared at the screen, our hearts pounding in our chests. The red room was gone, replaced by a single image, a close-up of Mr. Doom's face, his eyeless gaze fixed on us, his lipless mouth stretched into a sinister smile. And then, a message appeared in bold, red letters. The show is not over. The monitor blazed back to life, flames and lava licking down the screen like digital fire. The room was bathed in a hellish red glow, shadows twisting and writhing in the corners. But the horror wasn't confined to the screen anymore. Jake let out a strangled cry, his hand gripping my shoulder like a vice. His eyes were white with terror, fixed on something behind me. I turned slowly, my blood turning to ice. Jake's room, it was gone. His bed, his posters, his bookshelves, all vanished. In their place were three steel tables, stained a dark, rusty brown. And on the first table, my father. He was still alive, his eyes wild with fear, his mutilated jaw a gaping wound. 
He struggled against the razor wire, his muffled cries echoing in the room. Two other tables stood empty, awaiting their victims. We have to get out of here. Jake gasped, pulling me towards the door. We stumbled through the darkness, our feet sticking to the blood-soaked floor. My father's desperate cries followed us, a chilling soundtrack to our escape. As we burst into the hallway, I heard the sound of a car pulling up outside. Jake's parents were home. Relief washed over me for a fleeting moment, but it was quickly replaced by a surge of dread. They didn't know what awaited them inside. They didn't know that their home had become an outpost of hell. We raced down the stairs, our footsteps echoing in the silent house. Jake's parents were in the living room, their voices muffled by the walls. We were almost there. But then, the door to Jake's room creaked open. A long shadow stretched across the hallway, followed by the sound of slow, deliberate footsteps. Mr. Doom had entered the house. Mom. Dad. Get out of the house. Jake screamed, his voice raw with panic. The conversation downstairs abruptly stopped. A beat of silence hung in the air, thick with tension. Jake, his father's voice called out, laced with concern. What is it? Dad, there's someone in the house. Jake yelled, his voice cracking. Get out. Call the cops. Now. We were halfway down the stairs our hands gripping the railing, when Jake's father appeared at the bottom, a flashlight beam illuminating his worried face. Okay, boys, come down and we'll figure out what's. His words were cut short as a pale, skeletal hand shot out from the darkness, its spidery fingers sinking into his neck. A scream died in his throat as blood erupted from the wound. Then, with terrifying speed, he was dragged back into the shadows. The sounds of a struggle, muffled and desperate, reached our ears. Then, silence. A chilling, absolute silence. Jake's mother screamed. It was a high-pitched, primal wail that echoed through the house, sending shivers down my spine. We stood frozen on the stairs, our blood running cold. Jake's father, gone. Just like that. Taken by the creature from the red room. The nightmare had spilled out of the screen and into reality. And now, it was hunting us. Jake and I froze on the stairs, caught between the horror above and the unknown terror below. We were trapped, with no way to call for help. My hand instinctively went to my pocket, clutching the lighter. It was a small comfort, but at least it offered a sliver of light in the suffocating darkness. Where's mom? Jake whispered, his voice hoarse. Why don't I hear her? He looked pale and shaky, on the verge of collapse. Do you think Dad's okay? I didn't answer. How could I? We both knew the truth. We need to go back to your room, I said, my voice tight. Find another way out. But what about Mom? Jake pleaded, his eyes white with fear. We can't just leave her down there. We need to get help. I insisted. We can't fight that thing. We'll be killed too. A low, guttural crawl echoed from downstairs, sending a shiver down my spine. We exchanged a terrified look, 
then turned and fled back towards Jake's room. I raced to the window, fumbling with the latch in the dim light of the lighter. I had to get it open. We had to escape. But just as I managed to pry the window open a crack, a figure emerged from the shadows. Mr. Doom. His eyeless face was inches from mine, his lipless mouth stretched into a grotesque grin. His long, skeletal fingers reached for me, their sharp tips glinting in the flickering light. We were cornered. Fuck. Jake screamed, his voice echoing in the darkness. It's here. Run. He shoved me towards the window, the rusty frame groaning in protest as it slid open. I hesitated for a split second, peering down at the drop below, then started to climb out. Jake was right behind me, his hands pushing me forward, urging me to escape. But it was too late. A hand, cold and clammy, clamped around my ankle yanking me back into the room. I thrashed and kicked, my heart pounding in my chest. Another hand, smelling of decay and sulfur, covered my mouth, stifling my screams. I bit down hard, tasting the metallic tang of blood, but it only seemed to amuse the creature. Mr. Doom let out a low chuckle, then slammed my head against the wall. The world exploded in a burst of light and pain, then faded to black. Underscore 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 I woke to the sound of screams. My head throbbed, my vision blurred. I was lying on the floor, my body aching, my mind still reeling from the blow. As my senses slowly returned, I realized the screams were coming from Jake. He was strapped to the table, his face contorted in terror, his eyes white with fear. Mr. Doom stood over him his long, bony fingers tracing the outline of Jake's face. No! I cried, struggling to get to my feet. Leave him alone. But my voice was weak, my body sluggish. Mr. Doom turned towards me, his eyeless face a mask of malice. He raised a hand, and I braced myself for the blow. But it never came. Instead, he simply smiled, a chilling, predatory grin that sent shivers down my spine. The show is about to begin, he hissed. And then, he turned back to Jake, his fingers reaching for the scalpel that lay gleaming on the table beside him. I could only watch in horror, my screams echoing in the blood-red room as the nightmare unfolded before my very eyes. I awoke to a blinding pain in my head, a scream trapped inside my skull. My eyes fluttered open to the sight of rough ropes binding my wrists and ankles to a cold, steel table. Beside me, Jake lay unconscious, his face pale and drawn. Looming between us was Mr. Doom, his arms outstretched, a single black eye pulsating in each palm. They seemed to bore into me, drinking in my fear. Yaldabaoth has a red room waiting for every child in eternity, Mr. Doom rasped, his voice a grating echo in the confined space. Every parent, every brother, every sister. There is no heaven, not for the sons and daughters of Adam. Only endless suffering awaits you beyond the veil. 
Why? I croaked, my throat raw, my stomach churning with terror. Why are you doing this? Mr. Doom leaned closer, his smooth, featureless face inches from mine. There is no why, he hissed. There is only eternity. He straightened, his gaze sweeping over us. What color is death? He mused, his voice taking on a chillingly philosophical tone. The white light of tunnels leading up to heaven? The black of oblivion? The blue of cyanotic lips and dying fingernails? A harsh laugh rattled in his throat. It is none of these, he declared, his voice rising. Death is red, as red as the rooms where the damned scream in agony forever. Death is red, as red as a rose in full bloom. Eternity is here waiting for you, waiting to consume your flesh like a virus. His words hung in the air, heavy with dread. I looked at Jake, still unconscious, and a wave of despair washed over me. Were we going to die here? Was this our eternity? Trapped in a red room, at the mercy of a creature from the depths of hell? Mr. Doom stepped closer, a clint of something sharp in his hand. The black eyes in his palms burned with a malevolent intensity. The show, it seemed, was about to begin. Jake woke with a gasp, his eyes flying open. A deep gash whose blood across his forehead, and his nose bled profusely. He coughed, spitting out a bloody mess, his gaze darting around the room before settling on me, then on Mr. Doom. Terror dawned on his face. You killed my father, you piece of shit. Jake spat, tears mixing with the blood on his cheeks. Mr. Doom merely grinned, a chilling display of sadistic pleasure. Like father, like son, he whispered, his long, spidery fingers creeping across the table towards Jake. Gently, he removed Jake's glasses, revealing his fear-filled eyes. Please don't hurt me, Jake pleaded, his voice cracking. Mr. Doom's laughter was a harsh, grating sound as he lowered a sharp finger towards Jake's eye. No, don't, for God's sake. A wet squelch echoed in the room, followed by a scream of agony. I squeezed my eyes shut, unable to bear witness. But I couldn't escape the sounds, the sickening squish of flesh, the gurgling cries, the desperate pleas. When I finally forced myself to look, Mr. Doom was slicing open Jake's shirt with those razor-sharp fingers. One of Jake's eyes was gone, leaving a gaping, bloody socket. My stomach lurched, and bile rose in my throat. This was it. This was the end. There was no escape from this red room, no salvation from this monstrous creature. We were going to die here, just like Jake's father, just like countless others before us. Mr. Doom's hand hovered over Jake's exposed chest, his fingers poised like claws. He leaned down, his lipless mouth close to Jake's ear, and whispered something I couldn't hear. Then, with a swift, brutal motion, he plunged his hand into Jake's chest. The heart of all things, Mr. Doom rasped, his voice thick with morbid fascination. He plunged his hand deeper into Jake's chest, the sickening snap of ribs echoing through the room. But then, a new sound cut through the horror. Sirens. Faint at first, but growing steadily louder. Police sirens. A flicker of hope ignited within me, even as I watched my friend's life ebb away. Could help arrive in time? 
Could anyone stop this monster? Mr. Doom, seemingly oblivious to the approaching sirens, turned towards me, his face alight with a cruel glee. His left hand, the one without the eye, reached out and caressed my cheek. I flinched, but couldn't escape the touch of those icy, sharp fingers. Your turn, he whispered, his voice a chilling caress. I closed my eyes, bracing myself for the inevitable. But then, a crash from downstairs echoed through the house. The front door burst open, and shouts filled the air. Police! Everyone get down! Mr. Doom froze, his head snapping towards the doorway. For a moment, he seemed confused, disoriented. This intrusion, this interruption of his gruesome ritual, was clearly unexpected. This was our chance. With a surge of adrenaline, I wrenched my arm free of the ropes, ignoring the searing pain. I grabbed the scalpel that lay discarded on the table and lunged at Mr. Doom, plunging the blade into his outstretched hand. He roared in pain, his grip on me loosening. I scrambled away, just as a figure appeared in the doorway, a gun raised. Freeze, the officer yelled. Mr. Doom turned, his face contorted in rage. He lunged at the officer, but a shot rang out, and the creature stumbled back, clutching his wounded arm. More officers swarmed into the room, guns trained on Mr. Doom. He hissed and snarled, but he was outnumbered, outmatched. He was forced to retreat, melting back into the shadows, leaving behind a scene of carnage and despair. The nightmare was finally over. But the scars, both physical and emotional, would remain. The Red Room had closed its doors, but the memory of its horrors would forever haunt my dreams.